Sometimes it is difficult to come to grips with surprising or difficult news. Let me share an example this morning. A friend of mine and his wife were going to have their first child, and my friend John, he became convinced that they were going to have a boy. Now, they didn't go to the doctor and the ultrasound in order to find out. They wanted it to be a surprise. But when they came home from the ultrasound, John noticed that the doctor had given him more pictures than they asked for, including a picture of the baby's midsection. And he looked carefully at that picture, and he thought to himself, we're having a boy. He was so excited, we're having a boy. He could not believe, and you could not imagine the shock when about five months later, instead of little Caleb coming out of his wife, it was Olivia. And the very first words that his newborn daughter heard were her father yelling out, You're not a boy! If news like that can be difficult for us to come to grips with, put, try to put yourself into the shoes of Mary. When the angel Gabriel comes to her with this amazing bit of news. You are going to have a baby. Even though you've never had a husband or known a man, God's son is going to be that baby, and you are going to be his mother. Try coming to grips with this kind of news. It's almost too much. But it's not the first time that we hear this kind of news. Even in our text, we hear the angel mention that her cousin Elizabeth, who was in her old age, was also going to have a miraculous child who would be John the Baptist, that she and her husband Zechariah had conceived even though they were well advanced in years. Sometimes God calls us and gives us shocking, surprising, and difficult news, or asks us to trust him when it goes beyond our ability to understand. And when that happens, we kind of can come back to this story, this story of Mary. And as we anticipate Christmas, we, we, we marvel at this story that we too might be led to pray with Mary, may it be to me as you have said. Let's review the story a little bit. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. A casual observer of Mary's situation can easily understand why Mary would, when she gets this news that she is going to be a mother, even though she is a virgin, why she would ask this question. How can this be? How is this possible at all simply because such news goes beyond her ability to grip with reality to understand what is happening to her it just makes no sense and we can easily understand that because what's she going to say to her family and friends uh hey dad um so i'm pregnant and uh, don't worry, nothing bad happened. It's God. God made me pregnant. 
and it's God's son that's inside of me right now. Can you imagine how that would go over? Who would believe you? Who could grasp that reality and believe your word? But it's not like this is the first time we hear this news. Last week, we talked about John the Baptist. And John's father, Zechariah, also received surprising news when he went into the temple to perform his priestly duty in honor that he got perhaps just one time in his life and in the middle of this act of service before the Lord as he's trembling before God's altar the angel Gabriel appears to him as well and shares with him amazing news guess what you and your wife are going to have a son even though you're in advanced in your years And we can't really blame Zechariah for asking pretty much the same question that Mary asked. How can this be, since I and my wife are so old? How can this be possible? Perhaps you've heard the saying, truth is stranger than fiction. And in God's case, this is absolutely true. What God does when he acts in our world, when he intervenes in history and performs miracles, it's stranger than fiction. It's not something that we ourselves can can understand or really get at all. The words on the page might make sense to our minds, but when we try to understand them, they give us a headache because they're so difficult for our human reason to grasp. That God, the God who made all of creation, who was there at the the beginning of the universe, is now this tiny clump of cells inside of Mary's womb. Helpless. Needing her body to sustain and nourish him. How is that possible? That the God who creates and forms his righteous and holy will, his law, will be born subject to what his mother has to say and has to help her clean up the dishes. That the God who knows everything that there is and every possibility that exists in all of history in both directions, he's going to have to learn how to talk. And he's going to have to go to school with all of his little friends and learn the Hebrew alphabet, just like them, and how to read. That's just mind-blowing. How can this be? The reality is that very often in Scripture, God does things that lead us to ask that question, how can this be? And when we try to figure it out, it doesn't work. If we try to reason it, if we try to make sense of it, we're going to fail. Just this week, I was talking to a man, a prospect, I suppose, who, who asked, the, he didn't understand why is it that God had to die for sins? How can this be? That was the sense of his question. I don't get, why does God have to die in order to forgive our sins? And maybe as you look at scripture, there are things that God says and verses in the Bible that make you scratch your head. How is it that God who elects and chooses those who will be saved does not also then choose people who don't believe in Jesus to end up in hell? How can it be that Jesus' true body and blood are in the bread and wine that we eat and drink in communion when it tastes and looks and smells just like bread and just like wine? How can that be? If you were to study the history of the Christian church and all that happened in the 2,000 years since Jesus lived and where we are today, you would find that almost every single one of the false teachings and errors that people fell into started with a simple question. 
How can this be? When people like us, who want to know and want to understand God and his word with the purest of intentions, ask this question, how can this be? And then think that we need to be able to find the answer and understand it perfectly with our human reason. They fail. People have ended up rejecting that Jesus can be both truly God, fully God, and fully a human being in the same person. Because it just doesn't make sense. Some have said that Jesus' body and blood can't be in the Lord's Supper, that the bread and wine just symbolize Jesus' body and blood, because that's easier to understand. It's very easy for any one of us wanting and searching for answers that we can understand in our lowly human minds, asking that question to end up doing what Zechariah did. Do you remember what happened to Zechariah? He and Mary ask almost the same question. How can this be? But when Gabriel speaks to him and says, uh, and speaks to him and tells him the good news that John is going to be born, he then says, because you did not believe me, you are going to be mute. You will not be able to talk until the baby is born. This will be your sign, Zechariah. You won't be able to talk. So what's different about Mary and her question? Which, it's pretty much the same. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. When God speaks to us through his messengers, through his word, he knows full well that our minds cannot fully understand what he's saying. He understands perfectly well that when we try with our human intellect and thinking to rationalize or reason out what God is saying in his word, our minds are just going to collapse and turn into butter or something. He knows that the, the heavenly meaning that he wants us to, to believe and trust is beyond our understanding. So he also knows that Mary's question is not one of doubt. It's a question of wonder. How is this possible? It's a question of humility and a question that just expresses to the angel and to us that she knows her place before God and she doesn't get it. You see, what's even more impossible to understand than the situation that Mary found herself in is who this child would be. For her to sit and think about what the angel said later on, that this child conceived in her by the power of God is God himself you could imagine what her, what her thoughts went to as she thought those nine months waiting for the baby to come. As she thought about the, the pressure that she faces as a mother when no one else would believe the circumstances, how she got pregnant, or the fact that she is going to raise and care for not just a baby, but her own Savior, the one who had come down to this world to save her from sin itself, to save you and me as well. And that through her child that she would have to watch grow up and then suffer and die on a cross. I mean, all of this is mind-blowing. It puts her in a place where she could be asking God every day, every hour, every minute, how can this be, Lord, that you picked me for this job? Do you want to know the difference between Zechariah 
and Mary and their very similar question, how can this be? It's this. May it be to me as you have said. May it be to me as you have said. Even though Mary could not understand, she submitted herself to God's will. And so she believed what the angel Gabriel was saying to her. And she trusted that God knew exactly what he was doing by picking her. And so she marveled at it. Sure, surely this caused her a lot of wonder, a lot of pondering, thinking. But in the end, it comes back to marveling. To standing before God and saying, I don't understand God. But because you are telling me, because you are the one who is promising me and, and sending your angel to me, may it be to me as you have said. Sometimes that's what God calls us to do, isn't it? He calls on us to simply marvel at what he's doing in our lives at surprising or sudden news that can change our life in an instant. And sometimes God calls on us to put our trust in him and in his word when it really is a struggle for us and our human reason. But we come back to Mary and we see the childlike faith that she has in the Son of God, in the angel's message, and in the child who is now growing inside of her so that she can say with words of faith, may it be to me as you have said. During this season of Advent, we are pondering and we are contemplating what everything means. And we're looking forward to, we are anticipating the coming of Jesus at Christmas. But we also want to take a moment with Mary to stand back and simply marvel at how all of this is possible, at what God is doing in our lives, in the lives of our congregation, in the lives of all Christians here on earth, and in our world itself, to send himself to take on our human flesh, to come down and join our reality, and to take on our human intellect humbly, so that he would have to learn how to talk and learn how to read and learn how to study God's word even though that word comes from himself. It just leads us to marvel. How can all this be? The answer we find saying ourselves in our hearts of faith right alongside with Mary. May it be to me as you have said. And so the angel then can share with Mary the very best news. You have found favor with God. Not because Mary herself was so important or because she was such a good person, but because of God's mercy and grace and love. That she was God's child, getting to play a role in God's plan to save the world. And by faith, that message is for you. You too have found favor with God. God, the same God who came down and lived inside of Mary, is the same God who saved you from your sins. And by that grace, he says to you, you too have found favor with God. So we can say with Mary, may it be to us as you have said, Lord. And the good news, it will fill us with peace will fill us with the ability to marvel at what God does in our lives. Poor John, you know, he just couldn't grip this reality that he looked forward to for months and anticipated that when what he thought was going to be his son came out as a daughter, that this was going to be life-changing news for him. But guess what? When little Olivia was born, that was the best thing that ever happened to him. Much like most parents who have their first child and hold that child in their arms and say, wow, how can this be? It's awesome. 
This Christmas, we have even better news to marvel at. The news that our God became one with us. That we can marvel with Mary and say, may it be to us as you have said, Lord. Amen.